All right. Uh, so this is sort of a continuation of what we've been doing in some of our professional development contexts all year. Okay, but this is the bridge then from sort of the biblical infusion stuff into a little bit more of like the practical pedagogical fun. Um, but it's grounded in that biblical infusion stuff that we started with, right? So um, led by the spirit, informed by the scripture, inspired by Christ-like service leadership. That, those are our sort of linchpins. Part of that branch in informed by the scripture includes some methods. Uh, I'm looking for the book and I don't think I have it on my shelf. Uh, includes a couple of uh, methods that get distilled into a concept we talked about in August called contextualized education. Bless you. Okay. And so today's focus is this idea of contextualized education. It's like looking at my kids. Okay. Um, I'm so done with like the teaching with masks on and everything. Okay, so uh, so what we're talking about contextualized education. When we talked about this in August, we said that some of this contextualized education stuff grows out of what we talk about in and from the parables, right? So let's, let's flash back to that for a second. Let's take a parable we know and love. Uh, the Good Samaritan. So let's think about this. Part of what makes the parables so effective is their content married to a context. Right? Parable, Greek words para and follow. Follow meaning to throw and para alongside, like parallel lines. So parable is literally two things cast alongside each other, thrown alongside each other. And what you're supposed to do is compare the content of what Jesus says in his parable with the context either imagined or kingdom of God. So the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed. Start small, gets huge. Super paraphrase of what Jesus says there. But you're supposed to take the principle of small beginnings to dramatic changes to the end and compare that to the beginnings of the kingdom of heaven. We're supposed to consider what it's like to love God and love neighbor in the parable of the Good Samaritan by linking our life contexts and neighbors to the actions of the Good Samaritan. That's content, right? So Jesus' parable is the story. That's our content. Our context determines who we are and the role we play in the parable and the content that Jesus is talking us through. So if we've recently gone through a period of conflict with someone, and we feel convicted, like what we've done in that conflict wasn't what God would have us to do. When we come to the parable of the Good Samaritan, we don't necessarily feel like the Samaritan, and we don't feel like the man who's been beaten and left on the side of the road. Part of us feels convicted. We feel like the priest or the Levite. And so our life context matches up with the content that Jesus has provided us, and we learn something and walk away from that with a juxtaposition. I feel like it seems to me in my life right now that I am this, but I need to be this. And so my context helps me connect to a part of the story maybe I haven't connected to before. Same is true if we're in that conflict, but we are the ones sort of getting beat up on. Now we don't sort of think, well, how can I be the good Samaritan? We think I need a good Samaritan. And, and we experience the story from the space and place of the man who's been beaten and left on the side of the road. This is kind of the idea. But the beauty of the parables is that it's content and context. And Jesus provides us with these great moments to marry the truth, his content, with our life context by entering something together. And that's kind of the premise in a, a method that Walter Wink presents to us. Uh, Wink wrote a book about uh, Bible studies, and this is primarily congregational settings. But Wink's method is effectively that in a Bible study setting, the best and most effective methods aren't lecture, which I know there's a bit of irony because it's what I'm doing right now. Hmm. We're going to get to something that's not that, I promise. Um, the, the, best methods, the, the best methods aren't lecture. They're discussions guided and orchestrated by a question asker. So if we're going to unpack truth and material in a classroom, 
then some of the best, most effective methods are to unpack it by asking questions that are pointed and guided and orchestrated and drawing our students into something. So that's premise number one. Premise number two comes from an individual whose um, name is Ellen Langer, and she writes a book called Mindful Learning. And Ellen Langer's work links up to this idea of the parables. If, because he's sitting right here, if Micah is in here doing this dialogue, this back and forth with me, and there's nothing in his context outside or even inside this classroom at this time that drives part of his study and what we're talking about, then he disengages because there's no meaning in what he's doing here. It's just part of the classroom. Well, what tends to happen with younger students, especially, who are still developing that forward-looking mechanism in their brain that says, while I may never have to solve for X again after high school, I may need a skill set that allows me to analyze problems in a certain way. Well, they may not have that forward-looking mechanism to recognize that. They do have a life context outside of mathematics. And if we can link what they're doing in math, with a context that matters to their life, even if it's just interest, I'm interested in, then now their, their experience in our classrooms becomes more meaningful. They feel acknowledged as a human person as we acknowledge their broader life context. They feel validated. They also have an interest that drives it, right? So a uh, physics teacher at my high school, um, became a fan of our hockey team and would assign a sort of extra credit thing for students to come attend our high school hockey games and fill out a physics worksheet while they attended the game. Extra credit's always an interest when we talk about students. An evening attending hockey games for no good reason um, got them interested in the physics they saw things that then drove questions in our follow-up conversations in class on Monday. So they'd come to the hockey game that weekend, they'd do their sheet, they'd come in on Monday, and there were things about the experience in the physics that drove content. Now we're marrying a context with an interest from a student perspective to a content in the classroom and the educational experience in the room exploded, became something rich and meaningful because a student context was lined up with a classroom content. This is kind of the premise. And the parables that Jesus gives us are sort of the ways in which um, we can see from the scripture Jesus doing this content and context marriage. That's sort of the, the underlying foundation. I know it feels a lot longer in a really brief nutshell, right, of what, of what we're kind of talking about. Okay. Okay. So then, let's define contextualized education. This is, our, this is going to be our definition. Contextualized education is the use of practices, methods, questions, etc. that invite students to connect the content of our subjects with the concerns and contexts of their lives in and or outside of school. Okay, so the use of practices, methods, questions, et cetera, that invite students to connect content of our subjects with their concerns and contexts in their lives in or outside of school. Okay. So a context, why does it matter why is it important for a student to know how to solve for X? Just algebra, basic algebra stuff. Not rhetorical, actually asking. Why, why do they have to know how to solve for a variable? There will be unknowns in their life that they're going to have okay. to figure out. Okay. Why do they have to know how to solve for a variable in an algebra class for later academic pursuits? Skills in later academic, I mean later course. Yeah. It, okay. Just, just purely academic. Because most of our subject stuff builds, especially math and science. 
So there's an in-school context that we can apply it. Now, whether or not students recognize it and value that context is a different question. Creatively finding ways to help them value that context is part of our challenge as teachers. Why does this matter? Well, it matters because you're going to need it later. That typically doesn't work for a high school kid. So we got to find a way to say it matters because you're going to need it later without saying, well, you're going to need it later. Right? It matters because we're going to have to analyze situations like we analyze an equation solving for X. That may work. What might be even more effective is a, a word problem that connects something outside of just the random train A leaves at this time and train B leaves at that time. What time do they both get to Toledo? Right? Okay, so this is the concept that we're working through. How do we link what we do in our rooms with our kids in their life and situation such that what happens in our rooms comes to life? Okay. Okay. Teaching is shepherding. Remember that in August, right? Teaching is leadership. Teaching is shepherding. Okay. So we lead content, but we have to engage with context because none of our kids are coming into our rooms just blank, ready to absorb whatever we're talking about. They come with concerns, cares, and considerations for the world outside of the box we're talking in when we do class. Some of that context Quite simply, look at spring at CCS, some of that context is relationships, right? Some of that context is mom or dad is at home and they're sick. Some of that context is fill in the blank. What drives what we do? Their context? or our content, both. That's the, the tension question we're gonna explore today. Cool? Okay, so as a means of starting that exploration, does anybody remember the show, Who's the Boss? Okay, what's, what's the premise of the show, Who's the Boss? Tired baseball player. Uh, turns housekeeper okay yep for the, for the female that's right in business. big business lawyer was she a lawyer maybe she wasn't a lawyer. i don't remember i always imagine her as one okay so we have i was gonna say maybe that's because she looks like a, a person we know for like family friend and she's a lawyer maybe i'm just superimposing the two right so you, you've got female <laughs> business professional guy who becomes the nanny right Cooks, cleans, takes care of the kids, sees stuff off to school, etc. And it's the merger of theirs. Now, okay, so actual, who's the boss? Because the whole show pivots on that question. So who's the boss? She is. She is. <laughs> well, who's the boss? Because he kind of runs the house. But, 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 but she is. But the whole tension in the show pivots on that question. Right? Okay. What does that have to do with our classrooms? Well, with what you're asking, you're trying to decide, should the students be the ones driving your content or is it you? Okay, so who should drive content? It depends on the context of the student. Okay, <laughs> so, so who owns the content? We own the content. Why? Because presumably if they're in our <laughs> class, they haven't mastered it yet. But we, yeah, we are the expert. We, yeah. we have mastered, it feels really odd for me to stand up here and say, I've mastered my content. I haven't mastered anything when it comes to the scripture. I just know more than they do. Yeah. Okay. We, <laughs> we know more than they do. Right. I'm doing Hebrews right now, and I just ran across a podcast and went, oh, I never thought about the book of Hebrews like that. Hmm. And so now I have my kids testing a hypothesis while I teach on parallel lines. And I'm going, look, we're figuring it out together. Let's see what we come up with. That says, I, I know enough to aim us 
but I want your input and I need you too. I've created a context for them. The context matters because it says, let's learn together. The context matters because it says the pursuit of figuring this out together is important. Not every one of them buys into that context, but a lot of them have bought into that context. Like, ooh, this is cool. We get to test this out. We get to challenge the idea of somebody with a PhD in the book of Hebrews. Let's figure this out. Well, okay. So this is sort of what we're working with. We own the content. It's our stuff. We've got that mastery. We know those standards. We know those objectives. We know those content markers. We know where that's headed. But does any of that matter if it doesn't matter to our kids? Okay. So we own the content, but what do they own? They live the context. They live the context. And if we ignore their lived contexts, will we have credibility? Mrs. Stone's in the back going, no, 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 <laughs> no, we won't. We lose it, right? Because we just become the talking head of because I told you so. We, we turn into the teacher from Charlie Brown. Wah, 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 wah. They hear it, but it never sinks into anything that they can process. Because it doesn't have the life of a parable. And, th and this is the champ. So who's the boss? She was. Well, we are. But unless we consider where our kids are at, we might have the right content. We might have an, even, even have good ideas, but we might miss our audience. We might miss our kids. We might miss inviting them into something that allows them to attach life, their life, to what we want to communicate to them, to what the state and the school says we need to communicate to them. Still with me? Okay. At this point, there, there's a word we use in education that talks about meeting each student where they're at and tailoring what we do to meet that student. What's the buzzword? Differentiation. Differentiate, right? So when we come to a conversation like this, I've got to meet Tim where he's at. And er Erica, I got to meet you where you're at. And Sister Pitts, I, I got to meet you there. And if I don't meet you there, I miss you. Some of you may jump on board and stay with it, those of us in the room have jumped on board to stay with tackling this PD session. Those of us who are going to watch the video have jumped on board to tackle that. There's a context that says this matters to me. I want to jump into this. But without framing this in a way that makes sense to physics or history or our music and choir and biblical studies, then I lose part of what we could do together. So this is a way that we differentiate. Why is it so important to differentiate in our classrooms? I know we know this, but let's just talk it through. Why does it matter so much to differentiate in our room? Sure. And because of that, they have different needs. Why else? Styles, need. We want to make the content accessible to them, and it's not accessible if we're not at their level. Is accessibility about their ability? I think so. Please. Okay. Some of that is, and like, I don't do math nearly as well as Mr. Rice. Right? I I do it better than some of our students because I still remember a lot of my math <laughs> stuff. Okay. But. Like most of us, right? We, we have an ability. Brain development is further along. Forward-looking mechanism. We have an ability with what we know. They have an ability with what they know. Differentiation says, let me meet you where you're at and let's walk together. Well, so does contextualized education. It's just a way in which we try and differentiate. Okay. So how do you meet students where they're at in your content? 
not rhetorical brainstorm with me. Well, because mine's physical. Yeah. I talk about which sports and go. then use those things just like okay. your hockey example. Right. What, you know, how does the balls move? What happens when you kick them? What, you know, it's sure. whatever the you know pool and the bouncing off each other and okay. swimming and being on a float, you jump off the float, you go one way and the float goes the other way. But it's contextualized about, okay. I wouldn't have used that word to say that, but it is yeah. contextualized about what their interests are Good. related since the physics apply to all of them, I just have to find no, the yeah. connections. <laughs> the, the connections, though, that's what matters. Yeah. So, swimming pool, float, and jumping off of. They've done that a million times in their life, but they've not thought about the physics that govern the interactions they're having. Meaningful to them because they'd rather be in the swimming pool. We might lose some of them with the analogy because they'll start daydreaming about yeah, being yeah, okay. What else? How else do we do this for where our students are in our subject area? We do things other than lecture. We do active things. Like what? We do um, visual things. We do uh, kinesthetic things. In the sciences, we do labs. We go outside. We change the environment to see if some of those things will allow the connections to form. That's, that's immersive to a certain point, especially when you change the environment. We want to talk about the life of things that are taking place in our creek. We take them there. That's, it, that's an immersive experience. Now their context matters because they're stuck. They're out there in the creek. Mm -hmm. they, they either have a choice to engage and figure it out or they we have a choice. Out. That's right. <laughs> Literally up a creek. Right? Okay. How do we do it in music? Yeah, I... We did a long uh, study on teaching them key signatures. Okay. And what what are key signatures? Memorizing key signatures. How to see different and like and and using the okay in the song we're singing. What key is this in? Okay, I'm always drilling them on that. But I had to explain to them why that's important. What, why does that even matter? Sure. Why do we care what key it's in. Yeah. And explain to them, you know, because kids love music. Everybody loves music. A lot of people love music. And for them to understand that they could sing the same song in a different key and, and to match their voice okay. better as okay. a singer, that we could choose a key that's better for them okay. and, and make it something that like, oh, hey, there's a reason I would want to know what key this is. Okay, so there's there's two context pieces there. What's the first one? We all love music. We all love music. What's the second one? How does it apply to me? I can take it and make it mine. Well, the, the beauty of the first one is its interest. The beauty of the take it and make it mine context is that the way we frame it and the way we construct it, it's recreating something. That contextualized piece right there shoots to the top of Bloom's taxonomy. If we have something we know and we ask them to recreate the thing they know in something that matters to them, we're, we're going, not only are, is, is, are we creating that meaning, but now we're going up blooms. Because now I'm having them manipulate. I'm having them recreate. I'm having them reconstruct. They have to demonstrate they understand the basic principles that are there as they put it back together. For me, we did some basics in 1 Corinthians, and then I had them rewrite sections. Actually, it was Romans. I had them rewrite sections of the letter to the Romans as if they were writing the letter but making the same argument. And they demonstrated really clearly to me whether or not they understood Paul's argument or they could just regurgitate it. Because the way they restructured and recreated and reinvented showed me their depth because they either went up Bloom's taxonomy with it and they demonstrated that, or they stayed down here at here's the idea and I'm just gonna rephrase it. It's context. The first context is an enjoyment. The second context is a personalization. How'd they do with that? It's sort of a mixed bag. 
uh, it's sophomores. And so those individuals who really invested in the personalization of it did excellent, outstanding. I got stuff with emojis and their creativity was off the charts, but their articulation of the points mattered because they under they, they understood and they embraced. I, I have to make the same point, but I have to make it relevant. And their pursuit of relevancy drove them deeper into understanding what was going on in Romans. And so for those kids that latched onto that, it's excellent. For those kids that didn't, we, we stayed kind of down here. Well, I'll come back to that idea. So that was a mix. What about in history? How do we do some of this tailoring in history? Uh, a lot of politics and government, econ, not everything's black and white. There's a lot of debating and, and yeah. fight, they're finding themselves trying to figure out you know, what do they believe, mm -hmm. the direction our country can go in, and things yeah. like that. So it's a lot of you know, communicating to the different philosophies and different ideas, but then they are developing their ideas and what they believe and why they believe what they believe. And, seeing things from other sides. You know, yeah. some students will come in, they feel pretty confident that they know what they want, but they don't really understand what the other, the alternative possibilities are. And most of them probably yeah. heard what their parents have told them. And they're sure. kind of bouncing those ideas off, but seeing the other perspective, and sometimes that'll kind of move the needle a little bit on them where they're not exactly, they may leave Good. at least a different perspective than what they've heard before. So right. you know, they're developing their philosophy and ideas. Okay. Um. I'm, I'm walking through a couple of things in, in baptism and communion in my doctrines class that are talking about perspectives. So how do we take something with a multivalence of perspective and create something for our students in our content that has them contextualizing? Um, how do we provide them the personalization opportunities? What kind of questions could we ask them? Uh, let's dream up an assignment. So we're talking about... Um, the two political parties, and we want them to be able to articulate key or core ideas of a given political party in a sort of mock presidential race. What do we, what do we create that helps them attach their concerns to the content we're talking about? How do we craft those questions? I'm not sure if this is, well, yes, I know. But we just finished the subject, of, I mean, lesson on uh, responsibility. And so the uh, definition of responsibility is doing what God and others expect, those that God has placed over us expect us to do. But we all have responsibility. Mm -hmm. So we first we define that, and then they, they uh, search the well, I'll allow them to search the internet to find, not internet, but the, uh, yeah, I do. Yeah. That, so that they can uh, find out synonyms and anonyms that might necessarily okay. might give it to them. And you find scriptures all over that. However, uh, when we were studying it, the, the chapter dealt with two types of responsibility, which really, I told them, we're learning this together because I really have to write that. Yeah. I don't teach this every year. And I thought, wow, we have two responsibilities. One was personal responsibility, okay, and the other one opportunity responsibility. Okay, so they had to search uh, the scripture to do that, and then they came up with practical ways that we could show personal responsibility. Okay, they came up with doing the homework, yeah, doing the chores at home, sure. What are the opportunities? Well, there was an example in the chapter. Uh, I don't know if y'all know it, anyway, Sheldon uh, Jackson, okay, who actually saw a need in Alaska, and they were without food and clothing. And he saw that they, what what they needed. So he came up with this idea of bringing in the ring dealers okay. from other countries to Alaska, and it provided food and clothing for them, they, okay. for the Alaskans. So the students took on looking at responsibility, and so I said to them, let's all take it to a spiritual level. Let's take personal responsibility to be that it is our personal responsibility to have a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And then our opportunity responsibility is to share the gospel with others. And then I gave them, they had an assignment. 
how would you go about you know what are yours and they yeah. it, it really uh that's how all of this came about making a long story short they took it a lot of them took it to the next level of really reaching out and they came yeah. back to share with me how they had reached out to people yeah i saw it happening in my classroom cool uh with some of my uh what's called the, uh, it, the, the students that goes to mrs Dittor. okay uh, our class yes yeah. i saw that when one little girl was struggling with writing uh what was being said on the board that i had on the whiteboard yeah they went one of the girls got up and went over to her and sat with her yeah and said let me help you and i thought what an opportunity Good. one little girl didn't bring her lunch one day yeah and when well, she brought it she couldn't find it okay so another student went over to her without me i i'm they didn't even know i was paying any attention because i was sitting up there writing on my computer went and said hey you have have on my lunch then the two seven the seven graders got together and did that for mrs uh, for emily okay mm -hmm. Opportunity responsibility yeah. versus personal. So I see right. that. It's the personalization of it. Yeah. How do I exhibit this? And they're going to have more fun. Yeah. They were all engaged. They worked in groups and they just was engaged in it. And I saw it, I thought it with Kim. I saw such a change in their dynamics of how students they can work together when they really enjoy mm -hmm. instead of me standing there telling them. Right. You know, no, right. Step one, step two, step three, this is how you do it. They actually have the opportunity to experience it. Mm -hmm. And then at the very end, they do a self evaluation. Where am I? Sure. When it comes to this. Yeah. Okay. So, so we, we personalize it by, by putting them in, a, in a, situ, a, a mock situation where we give them a situation they have to play their way out of. So, a political situation, presidential race. We're gonna um, host a mock debate, or we're going to. Uh, you have, I don't know, three minutes to make a response to this point against your stance on this policy. How do you articulate it? And we we give them we personalize an opportunity where they have to process and work it through. We could turn that from a, a verbal. We can make that a verbal like presentation in class. We can make that a written product. Uh, but what they're doing now is being put into a given situation. It, it, it contextualizes what they're going to talk about. So when we did baptism and we did communion in my doctrines class, we looked at passages of scripture that have these things they'd never considered. So Mark 16, 16 says the one who believes and is baptized will be saved. And the one who does not believe will not be saved. And so I raised the question with my students. I said, does that mean you have to believe and be baptized? I said, well, I never heard that before. And I said, well, let's talk about it because there's a verse over here and we went somewhere else and we looked at it. And then there's a verse over there and we went and we looked at it. And so we started putting together this thing and I said, all right, so let's talk it through. Because some of us come to Romans 10, 9 and 10. Believe in your heart, confess with your mouth. Good. I believed, I said the thing, I said the prayer, I'm set. And then some of us look at Acts 2.38. Peter says in Acts 2.38, repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of sin and the gift of the Holy Spirit. Well, what is baptism's role there? Because some Christians understand it to be intimately connected to repentance. And so I, I put them in the evaluator seat. How do you understand what's going on in these texts? And how do you understand the way other people are understanding these texts. I'm asking them to evaluate. And we discussed for a few days, and then we got to the end of that discussion, and I said, okay, now your turn. What do you think? How do you understand it? Show me your train of thought. It's a, I'm personalizing it. Here's the big conversation in Christian doctrine, Christian theology. Here's the big political conversation. Here's the big... Now let's look at viewpoints and perspectives. Let's look at arguments. How do you create that? How do you understand that? How do you articulate that? We've taken a concept they may not even have thought twice about or cared about. And now we've placed them by the process in our room in a situation where with our content, their context becomes, what do I think? And for two weeks, all I've done is ask them questions and point them to places in the Bible
that other people go to answer the questions I'm posing. But I've not actually given them any answers. I've basically spent two weeks just problematizing things for them. Very carefully, knowing I've got high school kids who can very easily freak out about, wait, I've always heard this. Yes, you have. Yes, you have, and for very good reason. Now let's talk about why that's all you've ever heard. Well, let's talk about what other people have only ever heard and why this group of Christians over here only ever hears this and your group of Christians only ever hears this one. It opened up a conversation and now they're sorting it through. Now they're working on it. Now they're, I placed them in the confusion and none of us like being confused. And so now they're all trying to sort it out. It's contextualized. That doesn't work all the time, though, because you can't keep doing that to kids. You exasperate them. <laughs> but if you do it strategically, and we do it in these well-crafted moments with our content and helping them connect a context to it, we see something grow that, that can be really fruitful. But I want to pause here, and I want to ask a question. Is, is, there, a, is there a risk in this? method okay I mean they all get involved to some when it when it comes to assignment unless they just choose not to do it they all get involved there at least risk is not getting through all the content you need to get through. Okay, how do I navigate my content if I'm going to be sort of super intentional about this connection? The other risk might be being overly concerned with the context that we don't go deep enough with the content. Or being so overly concerned with the student choice and the student context driver that we stop being the boss. We stop being the one who organizes and aims and directs and crafts and leads. And we've given too much to a group of students that still needs the organizing and the aiming and the directing. We're relying on them too much and their context too much. We're not providing them enough content, enough direction, enough steering. But it's, it, but it's a really tense balance between those two things. What else, what else are we thinking through? Because if you're, if you're processing and chewing on the idea, let's sort of think out loud. Those of us who are watching this on video are, are, are processing and thinking too, and they don't have the opportunity for the dialogue. So maybe if we dialogue, they can hear it. I think there is a, a risk, depending on the students, especially at higher level students, when they realize what's going on, mm -hmm. It gets to the who's the boss, but they can really begin to monopolize. They can. Why? They can. Either manipulating their contexts to their advantage. Okay. Or driving the train. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, we have to be careful. I've been thinking about this a lot in relation to community group questions, the content for communities. Because Darren Lewis brought up an interesting yeah. point, this very thing. Um, and we need to discuss this more over the summer. But when I push out questions for discussion for community groups, it's usually, what do you think? What do you think? Trying to get them to engage. But perhaps there needs to be more of a plumb line or more of a, mm -hmm. uh, an anchor in there somewhere so that it doesn't just get into a situation where students are just sharing all their ideas and there's no real guidance, especially when you're talking about student leaders. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I've been just been kind of percolating in the back of my mind about how to find that balance because mm -hmm. we do want discussion to mm -hmm. transpire. And that, that, works for, that works for in-classroom discussions when I want my kids to discuss something from the biblical text. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it means instead of starting with, what do you think about it becomes, let's look at this, whether it's from the scripture or it's from someone else. And we talk about 
what are, how, what are we thinking, feeling, responding to from this? Right. And, and we, we anchor it somewhere because now they, they can only go so far away from that anchor. We, we've got them entrenched. And this is the role of our content. We've, we've got to anchor them somewhere. We can contextualize a, a genetics project, but we've got to anchor them somewhere with that genetics material in the first place. Um, we can we can anchor the story of U.S. history in a in a personalized context, but we're still anchoring the story. Um, Jesse Holtus did this with uh, uh, an ancestry project he had his students do, where they went and did an ancestry.com sort of backfill in U.S. history, and then sort of played through the lives of their ancestors in U.S. history as they went through the history. I do that kind of story anchoring in my philosophy class. My students create characters who get to be special in time travel, and they go visit all these different eras of philosophy and theology, and they become students of these great thinkers. And, and the anchor is the content. Your job as a student in my class is to be an expert in at least one thinker at every major period we study. But it's contextualized in the story of their character. And so everything they do takes the flavor of their created character. They get to live out this fictional narrative. And for my science fiction fans, Doctor Who, and they love it. They go nuts with it. For students who are wrestling with theological tensions, um, I'll leave names out, but I had a student a few years ago who was wrestling with authority in the church. Why do, where, where does the Protestant claim for authority come from versus where, where the Catholic claim for authority comes from? Because the Catholic church has got 2000 years of church history and apostolic succession. And how, how do Protestants anchor themselves in a kind of authority? What, what's transpired in history? So she took up a character that was Joan of Arc's sister and dealt with, amongst other things, at a really poignant moment when we talk about Joan of Arc, the tension of the church's treatment of her sister as a character and wrestled out this idea of authority and faith and who has it and where it comes from and what do we, this was a personal wrestling, but she got to live into that as she lived into what we talked through and anchored in content. And so we've, 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 thinking about content as anchor helps. Context is the rope we give them to sort of sail the waters around that anchor. If we don't have enough anchor, then they sail off into Neverland and we lose them. If they have too much anchor, then they don't have enough sailing to be buttressed by the wind and, and to gain some, some ground. Like teaching is an art and not a science. <laughs> yeah, right. That's where that's where I was going to go. So this is the, this is the art of that crafting, and it means uh, being willing to take that risk every now and then. It all it also means some I don't know, maybe some honest conversations with our students. Hey, I want to try something. Will you Will you try with me? I say this to my students all the time. I want to try this. Let's see how it goes they at least appreciate my willingness to go with them and give it a shot and see if it works. What else are we thinking or feeling about this, this tension, context, and content? What, what's turning in our, in our teacher brains? For some teachers, it's easier to just deliver the content. Mm. And then I don't have to worry about mm -hmm. think about it anymore yeah it's more work it's more energy it is yeah it is it's a lot it's a lot more energy for sure <laughs> i've been thinking that that we are fortunate in a small school setting mm -hmm. to have small class sizes mm -hmm. to where we can actually get to know and invest in the kids on, you know, yeah. in their own context yeah. on a very personal level, yeah. the more we know them, the better we can contextualize this. And we have such small classes, we can actually mm -hmm. take the time to invest in the kids personally. Yeah, 100%. What are, along that line, what are some ways we can contextualize 
that doesn't have to have this direct correlation to content. I think, I think you're touching on it. Let's talk about it. To be present in their world. Yep. What does that look like as a teacher to be present in the world of your students? Means attending things that they're involved in. We have two full tables of teachers attending prom. <laughs> um, it means supporting them in their endeavors. Yeah. Well, the small class you can ask them last week and they go, "How are you going today?" You know? And actually having the spirit of discernment too, that you can tell them that the students are not. When you get to know them, mm -hmm. uh, you can tell yeah. the difference in their character when they walk in the door. Mm -hmm. The body language says something is going on. Yeah, I experienced that today. Yeah, with Bree, you all know Bree on the right. Mm -hmm. She's always very, very upbeat. And this is this how you done? But today she came in. And it was that? It was. It was a struggle day. It was. It was, it was one of those days, mm -hmm. and I said, and I just let her know. I can tell you all right, and she goes, I am. Yeah. I didn't know I was teaching, and I could I could feel that that was that we weren't connecting today like we normally connect. Like sure. Something is going on here. Yeah. Um, and so when we go, she did. She stayed after and talked with me. And I was like, well, if you trying to teach, and they are out there somewhere, and they were they were meant to really get in this uh, evangelizing. How important it is to share the gospel. I can see the faces like, <laughs> and it's, yeah. it's strange. It, it really it drains you when you're teaching under those, you know, when you know that something is going on, mm -hmm. but they don't feel comfortable enough to talk about it. Yeah. No, it matters. And then sometimes we, I know, I my mind is set that I want to get them to a certain point because they must get this project done. So usually <laughs> in a situation like that, I would stop and say, hey, Talk to me. What's going on? There you go. But I didn't today because I was like, oh, no. <laughs> I got to get to this. <laughs> yeah. So I made what I was teaching more important than what I saw was going on in that class. It's a balance. I was going to say, sometimes sometimes we have to do that. Yeah, we do. Sometimes if we stop and we acknowledge or we investigate what's going on, we get fuel to a fire that we need to put out. Mm -hmm. But sometimes we need to look at them and go, okay, it's Tuesday. And you guys look like we've been in school for the last 18 days straight. What is going on? Well, we've got this many tests and what? Okay. So what do you need from me in class today? How do I help you engage to do what's on our docket today? Okay. That sometimes can create a healthy conversation. Mm -hmm. And we, they learn that we're not just, well, let's just plow ahead with whatever we got going on. We care about them. This, this was, um, one of the biggest things that came out of some of the work I did in my dissertation. And it was surprising. Um, I asked a lot about the pedagogy. I asked a lot about the methods. Um, and I had students answering these surveys. Uh, one of my students said this, uh, it's clear you care about the students and the topics we discussed. The approach you take with asking questions and drawing conclusions from the text makes the class fun and easy to learn from. Um, it's clear you care about the students. It was the combination of caring about them and caring about the scripture that brought things together. So if we have an experience in our room where we care about our content, but our students struggle to see that we care about them, this is why we started with this biblical infusion idea and that teaching is shepherding and teaching is leading and the way that we connect with our students and we're led by the spirit that last session that we had because if we come in and it's only ever clear to our students we care about the content we lose the people that we're trying to teach can i share with them about yeah. mr dyson real quick I feel yeah like the people on the video yeah. though because yeah, they can't necessarily feel what's going on. But. Well, I can, I, I can relay if you okay. want. Okay, well, so. I'll, I'll just try to, I'm going to do my um, We had a teacher candidate come to present a sample lesson. And one of the things he did is every time he engaged with a student, he asked their name. So he knew their name, and then he would reflect back to them later using their name again and using the thing that they had said 
and so that I'd be brief with them afterwards about how it went, that went so far with them that he wanted to know their name and then was attentive to what they were saying and using their thoughts later to refer to something else, it meant the world to them. So, and it's a small thing, you know, for someone you're just meeting, but for them, that was huge. Yeah. It meant a lot. Yeah. For our, for our video audience, Mrs. Stone was just telling us the story of one of our uh, candidates, actually uh, Mr. Geisen, the individual we hired for um, Bib Studies in our, in our role. Um, in his sample material, he connected um, with students by asking their name and then referring back to them by name and what they had contributed to the conversation by talking about Emily's idea or Alex mentioned this earlier or Becca said such and such. And that when the students debriefed, their comments were, he asked and remembered who I was. Somehow that provided context. You think that's contextualization somehow? Yeah, it is. It is. Because that personal touch of I care enough about you to ask and to remember that that's Tim. Just like you did here. You mentioned physics, you mentioned history, you asked that's about right. music. Right, you know? right. That's right. So part of what part of what we just did together is what I'm talking about. The content that's anchored the conversation is what do we do in our classrooms? It's our pedagogies. It's our practices. It's our methods. But the context, the leash I've given you is talk to me about it in music and talk to me about it in physics, biology. What about in history, econ, gov? What about in biblical studies? And this, this is the challenge because it means being willing to establish a footing and then asking our students questions or, or sort of giving them some leash to run with something that we've established somehow, right? So Mr. Rice always does his CCS property project with one of his classes. I don't even know which one it is. It just normally involves food and I get some of it. So, <laughs> but they love that because they have this op this creative opportunity. So one of the, one of those ways we contextualize is trying to ask for the content in creative ways, ways that are outside the the typical boundaries of hear these questions, answer them for me. So I, I was telling you about this thing with Hebrews in New Testament and the idea that I've been exposed to. And so what I've done with my students is said, I'll show you how Hebrews makes an argument. We did that today. We talked about uh, priesthood in Hebrews chapter seven and how Hebrews constructs a series of arguments that brings you to a logical conclusion. It's a series of if then statements basically. And I said, okay, the premise that Dr. Amy Peeler is putting forward is that the family vocabulary and the father-son vocabulary, the book of Hebrews, matters not just because of who Jesus is, but because of who we are because of who Jesus is. Here's the logic for how Hebrews works. Now I want you to apply the logic to her idea, does it work? I have them now testing. I've given them a way to get in. I've anchored them somewhere, and now I'm going to let them go play. That's. Mm -hmm. But are, but are they ready? Can't do I need do I need to tweak? Do I need to modify? Do I need to do I need to come alongside our class students, and say okay. This this may be too big. Let's let's narrow our focus down, or let's truncate what I'm going to have you do with it. But it's still a way for them to get into something and put their hands on it and get their understanding in with it and, and start to pull on some of those things that work. It's interests with physics. Yeah? Okay. Um, how much of a can of worms do I want to open with five minutes left? I'm going to hold on to some of these questions for the next time we get together because this will help create a sort of a brainstorm of ideas. Um, <laughs> when we when we contextualize or differentiate, does it does it happen with our lecture Socratic model with the process we engage in a classroom? Does it happen with our assignments? Does it need to happen with all of it? Where 
where do you see there being traction to get started thinking contextually when it comes to your content with your students? I like to early put them. <laughs> yeah? How? You, can you give me an example? Or give us an example? Um, in anatomy and physiology, the idea of um, diseases and disorders that with, with whatever system we're working on uh, are things that they've heard about or know okay. about or have had experience with. So we take things they know of in general terms, diseases or disorders, I'm rephrasing for video folk, with certain body systems, and then what do we do with that? Uh, that captures their interest, so okay. then when we get to the nitty gritty where I just have to lecture, <laughs> yeah. they uh, have some context. They have an interest because of where we've started. They, they've got a hook that brings them in. So this disease or this or disorder in, so, if I was going to do it, we, let, let's talk about paresthesia and the central nervous system, which is the pins and needles pain that I get to deal with for whatever reason. We can't figure that out. So there's there's my interest driver. Oh, okay. yeah, I want to know about that because that's what's wrong with me. So let's see if we can figure some of this stuff out. And then when we get to the stuff that's the dry, that that's the, okay, guys, I got to give you content. They give us the latitude because there's some other piece that's already got them interested in what we're talking about. Absolutely. That, yeah. That's a, in music, I, I have a variety of styles that we are performing in our concert next week. Um, some of them are, are awesome fun, like we've got a musical theater piece, and all most of the kids in this class love musical theater. It's their favorite thing. And this is the first time I've actually let them do one. Yeah. Um, but we're also doing a piece entirely in Latin, and <laughs> that is not entirely fun for them. That's right. But we discuss the value of it. We discuss what the words mean. Okay. And it's a worship song, and there you go. And and you know that's that's hardcore content in the music world. Right? Yeah, but that's in Latin. but that's also a beautiful context. Uh -huh. Yeah. You're talking about something in Latin that has worship uh -huh. as its intention uh -huh. in a, in a place. With Christian students, at least hope, hopefully, yeah. or or students coming to a realization of yeah, this is what I believe, and I'm going to sink my teeth into this. We've layered in another context, and it's worship. But there's a spiritual context to what we do here as well, beyond just the I need to be faithful with my studies because I'm supposed to do everything for the glory of God. That's one of those general ones we can toss out there for our kids, but then they just dismiss it. Yeah, but whatever. It doesn't. It needs. It needs something to anchor it. Good. Context matters, right? Uh, we, we turn off TV shows or political debates because context matters. We have choice of context for all of the stuff we get interested in, the podcasts we listen to, the music we listen to, the whatever that we listen to. But when we come to classrooms, we lose a lot of our ability to contextualize it. Because in a, in a high school program, there's certain stuff they just got to take. Well, the, the point is not we have to make it entertaining. But the point is if, I'm, if I invite them into something with me that is meaningful to them in a way beyond a grade on a transcript, then, then what happens with our content becomes richer. Become, fuller and sometimes those those individuals who've not been invited before with context come to life that's that's kind of the heartbeat here um, the heartbeat in contextualized differentiation is remembering that that the people in our rooms are people and we're teaching people not content and that's, it, it's tenuous sometimes. It's got a real tension to it, but it's got a real reward in it too. And that's the development of our, our people, our students, which that's part of this discipleship piece. I think our students knowing and understanding that that they matter to Christ because they matter to us. It's 
part of where this biblical infusion bleeds into this contextualized practice. For me, this contextualized method, which doesn't have to be every single thing, every single day, so steeped in this context that we don't, ha we don't have anchor anymore. There's stuff we need to talk about, stuff we have to do. But when they know I care about them, they give me that latitude. They, they give me that room to, to do the teaching stuff. I think you develop, you know, you put deposits in the bank account, but but you develop yeah. a, a reputation and a trust yeah. that even if it isn't connected yet, you will get it connected eventually. Because sometimes I connect at the beginning, and sometimes I realize halfway through that, yeah, okay, maybe I thought I connected it, but it isn't connected. We got to get there. Again. That's right. Um, yeah. And so, but yeah. over time, they trust you to connect it somehow. That's right. It, or tell you that it's not connected. Yeah. <laughs> right. No, I tell my students all the time, I'm going to connect it, but we're not there yet. Or I tell them, hey, we got to shift gears. This and this. Yeah. Okay. But that, that kind of authenticity with the generation of kids that we are teaching buys us rapport. It puts money in the bank when we're honest. We don't have to tell them everything, but I've said to my kids multiple times, guys, I tried something yesterday and it didn't work. And you're all evidence to the fact that it didn't work because I watched you glaze over. I tried, let's try something different today. Let's see if we can make it land. That, that, that buys us. That, that, it gives us space to goof as we endeavor together. Okay. Um, that's our hour. We're a little over. It's only like a minute and a half, but we're a little over. I want to honor your time. We'll, we'll pause here. We're, we'll pick up the conversation next week, and we'll do some more with the the hows and the whats and the, the, the building blocks of how, how we create this. So it'll look like me asking you a bunch of questions again. Until next time. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Happy to.